Let me introduce Ken Butler from Adventist, and his talk is titled The Road to Chiplets is Paved with Data. Ken is a strategic business creation manager at Adventist. He works with customers on analytic capabilities as part of the Adventist Cloud Solutions platform. Thank you, Zoe, for the introduction, and thank you to the uh, MEPTEP community for the opportunity to come in and talk today. So uh, I wanted to start off by sort of characterizing the growth in electronics and how it, uh, and how it impacts test data, because we're talking about data and test today, and I'm going to be very focused on test data throughout this presentation, as was somewhat in the, in the previous presentation. And, you know, the expression that comes to mind is the tyranny of numbers. And uh, there, there was, I, I did a little bit of digging on where the, on the, on the origin of this, of this saying, and it comes from a gentleman named Jack Morton, who was the vice president of Bell Labs back in the 1950s. And he was talking about, you know, electronic systems that would have made up to tens of thousands of electron devices, which was an enormous number back in those days. And then, but now we consider what that looks like today. And uh, there was some interesting work that was published by Dan Hutchison of VLSI Research in 2015. And it was estimating uh, the, the total number of, comp of transistors that were built in that year. And the number came out 250 billion billion. And they were kind enough to sort of say, well, the, the 2021 figure is 1.6 by 10 to the 21. So another order of magnitude plus. Uh, and it's just a fantastically large number of components that we build collectively as an industry every year. And it's just grow it's growing and growing, particularly with chiplet based systems as we're seeing in these presentations. So how much test data does that generate? So let's make some simplifying assumptions. Let's assume that only 80% uh, of those transistors get tested. Maybe the other 20% are in applications that don't require it or that's part of a sampling strategy or something like that. Now let's assume that we get just one bit of data from each one of those, of those elements. If you do the math and figure out how much data are we generating, then it's 40 terabits per second using the 2021 figure. And of course, that's, a, that's very simplistic because you know, we don't get just one bit of data. We, we test things multiple times. We have to characterize performance. We have to diagnose and look for failures and those sorts of things. So the amount of data that we're generating is just phenomenal when you think about it. And, the, and those are not the only trends that have an impact on data. There's other trends that we see in the industry. And you know, everybody here is probably mostly aware of these things. There's a tremendous growth in the automotive sector, which brings with it zero defects um, you know, mindset in term, or, or parts per billion type escape rates, extended reliability requirements, extended temperature operation. All of that requires data in order to be able to characterize these devices to make sure they have the, the best quality and the, and the best reliability you can, you can get. There's disaggregation in the manufacturing environment. So we just finished talking about that, about the, the complications of data movement and data sharing where it's crossing boundaries. And we still, as, as Sergio did an excellent job of talking about, you have to, there's IP that needs to be protected. So we have to move this data in a secure way. There's growth in machine learning. And, and again, Sergio's presentation was an excellent uh, exposition of that. You know, so it has test time implications, there's IP wrapped up in these uh, machine learning models that has to be protected. Uh, so we're always uh, vigilant on that. Advanced lithography methods, which we've talked about in the last two days with uh, new defect mechanisms and subtle failure mechanisms that are getting harder and harder to detect, which again, require a lot more data analysis in order to be able to accomplish. And finally, we're starting to see people moving from on-premise to cloud-based solutions. And again, I think we saw a bit of that in Sergio's talk uh, beforehand that has implications in terms of uh, uh, protecting IP and also being able to have high performance solutions that can do real time in inferences and be able to do those uh, fast enough that you can you know, not impact overall uh, you know, test time and, and operations therein. So, and Sergio also mentioned Lee C. Wong. And so I had a couple of, uh, of piece of data items that came from his uh, team at UCAL Santa Barbara that was published at the International Test Conference a couple of years ago where they did uh, uh, a, 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 a data, an inference engine to classify publications since 1995 at ITC and looking at what sorts of subjects people were interested in. And what we saw in the, in the most recent years is there's a tremendous growth in the automotive space and there's a tremendous growth in this analytic space. So many, many, lots of people are you know, working in this area. They're 
actively pursuing solutions in these spaces or whatever, which is driving a lot of this data that we see. And of course, this is a chiplet based event. So we have to talk about that. And there's lots of aspects of test and data that are influenced by uh, chiplet based solutions. Obviously, the larger the system that you have within a package, the amount of test data has to go up dramatically. So we have more uh, test data to deal with with each single device. Uh, there's the known good die issue, which Terrence talked about this morning. Uh, so we have to characterize each chiplet completely because we want to ensure that when it gets integrated, that uh, it's going to work in the integrated uh, solution and not uh, cause any quality issues where we have very expensive rework or, or, or having to scrap the part. Die traceability is something that's much more important in a, in a chiplet type solution because, and again, Terrence talked this morning about debug and root cause analysis. And one of the speakers yesterday talked about this problem of die matching. So you want to measure the performance on, on each of the chiplets that's gonna go into the system because sometimes you have to match them in order for the overall system to function correctly. And uh, that again, requires a, a lot of data analytics to make that happen. Uh, and we need to understand that, you know, the origin of these parts, where did they come from? How were they manufactured? What was the test that was applied? You know, all of these details because we have to be able to continually track these things through production. We've seen over the last couple of days that the uh, functional content and system level content is going up. And in case you're not familiar, when I say the term functional content, what I really mean is test content that does not utilize the on-chip DFT or design for testability structure. So something other than scan or memory disk, for example. So we're, we're, as an industry, we're doing a lot more of these things. And what, that, what the, the end result is, is that electrical, and again, uh, this was also discussed by Terrence, that electrical failure analysis becomes more complex and more data intensive. You have to collect a lot more information in order to be able to get down to root cause when you have a failure in a situation like this. And, and finally, also, again, Terrence talked about this this morning, that there's a need to, in his term, shift left. So we need to migrate more test content earlier in the flow, because again, we're trying to avoid situations where you have a defective unit at the end of line, where there's the most cost that's going to be incurred if you have to rework or scrap the device. And in my experience, and, and something that I did in, years ago was you have to do a lot of correlation work to look at a failure of interest at the end of line like at system level test or at burn-in in order to be able to correlate something back, say for example, at wafer probe that can predict that outcome and you can get that unit out of the stream earlier, but that's a, a huge data analytics exercise in order to be able to do that. So all of these things are specific to chiplets and they all have implications in terms of the, the data analytics work that we have to do. So what are product, in the, in the face of all these challenges and in the face of, uh, you know, these chiplet-based solutions, what do we see product teams asking for? And I wanted to kind of take you through a few examples uh, uh, to kind of illustrate these are the kinds of solutions that people are talking about. So I'm going to talk about an adaptive e-test solution where we're optimizing the data collection process uh, during e-test in order to be able to increase throughput and kind of streamline the operation to make it go more smoothly and quickly, but still be able to get the root cause uh, as, as quickly as possible. I'm gonna talk about real-time analytics and, can, and Sergio covered this a bit already. I'll talk a little bit about it also, where again, as he emphasized, you have these machine learning workloads that people are doing today uh, that they need to utilize in order to be able to get the best outcome for every product. And, but we need to be able to streamline that operation and, and make it go faster. And then at the end, I'll talk about probe burn prediction. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different data sources that we have to look at and I'll kind of illustrate a little bit about what that looks like. So uh, I don't see any questions come up yet, so I will continue. So we'll start with the uh, uh, e-test solution. And just in case you're not familiar with e-test, I thought I'd spend just a little bit talking about, a little bit of time talking about that. So e-test goes by a lot of different names. Sometimes we call it e-test, sometimes we call it parametric test. Sometimes we call it wafer acceptance test or WAT, W-A-T. And what happens here is that, you know, it, IC manufacturers will fabricate in the scribe lines, which are these spaces in between the dies on a wafer, uh, test structures that they're gonna use to, to test, to monitor the process performance as the wafer is being manufactured. And these test structures may be something simple like an individual transistor or some other individual component. Um, 
you're going to do this on a, on a limited basis across the wafer. These structures will be fabricated everywhere, but you may test at uh, 20 sites on the wafer, for example. And you use this as a process monitor where you spread these sites across the wafer and you're, you're monitoring overall process performance. And, and the challenge here becomes when you find something that's out of spec, now you have to react to that. And you need to do that quickly because you're going to lose time in manufacturing if you do that. And time is money. So you have to be able to react to these things quickly. And normally, in the normal way of doing things, that involves uh, uh, unarchiving material, going back and putting it back on the chuck, retesting it, collecting a bunch of additional data, and, 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 doing that, that, and then doing the manual analysis necessary in order to understand what the root cause is. So we've been working on something that we call Dynamic Parametric Test, or DPT. And this is uh, uh, done in conjunction with our partners in PDS Solutions. And, and the idea is that it runs on top of the V93000 SMUA parametric test solution uh, and combines with the PDF Solutions Accentio uh, portfolio. And it allows customers to be able to uh, specify rules that are going to monitor the operation of, and the, and the uh, measurements that are being taken during e-test. And, and look for these situations where you're starting to drift out of control. And within a small number, a small amount of time within milliseconds, be able to uh, adjust the test flow in some way in order to be able to re react to this and collect the information that's necessary to get the root cause. So what does that look like? Uh, so this is just a simple example where I'm, I'm doing a diode measurement that I'm measuring, you know, these values. And I'm, as I'm going across my, my, uh, my e-test points on the wafer, I detect a measurement that is out of spec with regards to where it's supposed to be and, or in, and compared to the others. And these triggering actions can be controlled in, in, a, in a variety of ways. You know, you can set hard limits, you can look at CPK values, you can look at other statistics from a, you know, across the, the rest of the lot, but it's, it's, up to the, it's up to the manufacturing environment on how these rules are specified and how, and how the triggers occur. And then what happens in a situation like this is that you switch in this particular case from a spot measurement to a five point sweep and you collect additional data above and beyond what you would normally collect. So we are uh, testing additional sites and we are uh, taking additional measurements, which is going to drive the root cause analysis process so that we can isolate to a particular failure mechanism. So we can go back and make corrective action in the fab in terms of whatever adjustments need to be ma made. And in this case, in this case, it's a reticle or an etch issue that was identified. So, but we react to it very quickly without having to go through all the manual retest and manual analysis in order to be able to make this, this, this overall process work. So maybe I'll pause there for a moment and see if there are questions before I move on, because I'm going to move on to the next example. I yeah, there are currently no, no questions in the, the Q&A. If anyone would like to ask a question, please do add to Q&A at any time. And Ken will answer interactively. Nothing there right now, Ken. So maybe carry on and check back. Okay, in very good. Slides. I'm, I'm, yeah. I have the window open and I'm keeping an eye on it just in case right. something comes up. Okay, so now I'm going to move to adaptive test and real-time analytics. And, and again, you know, this concept uh, was covered very well by Sergio. So... Uh, you know, I'm probably, uh, I, I don't know that there's a heck of a lot I can add to what he said or whatever, but I'll try to do that. So the idea is you're probably familiar with, certainly all of you in the test industry, is that historically, be it e-test or production test, we've always traditionally gone with a one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so what we, but, but that doesn't really take advantage of, of the idea that the material is varying, the, the material as it flows in is, is varying. And so we have to, ideally we would like to be able to use the test resource uh, adaptively in order to be able to test each die in the most effective way possible so that we get the, the right outcome from every product. And I'll stop there for a minute because somebody asked a question, how is the root cause found automatically? Well, what happens here is you establish a set of rules and these rules come from the knowledge of the process. So you can set up the rules in such a way that when you detect a particular mechanism, you know, based on your experience, you know that if a certain measurement drifts in the following way, it's more than likely associated with root cause. So that comes with experience, but that's the way I would say that this is done automatically. But 
it, it's it's really more it, it draws from the the overall experience in the way for fab for the particular process technology and the kinds of parts you are uh, you're working on. Okay, so stepping back into real time production tests, you know what we're saying is, a, and, and again Sergio covered this, is that a better time is to be able to adapt the test flow, the contents, and the limits to the material at hand. I think I need to get back on the window. And we've seen, you know, uh, lots of publications over the last few years. I kind of hinted at that when I showed you Lee C. Wong's data on this, that uh, people are, are constantly looking for solutions to be able to do test adaptively and, and, and utilize their, their critical test function uh, in the most effective way. So there was a couple of papers that I just pulled here, one from uh, TI in 2019 and another one from uh, Qualcomm at the VLSI test symposium a few months ago. Uh, one, uh, the TI paper involves minimum voltage search and the, uh, the Qualcomm paper involves uh, trimming. Trimming is when you are tuning the device by adjusting uh, parameters for specific components on the die. In both of these cases, you wind up doing repeated uh, applications of a test in order to search for the optimum uh, outcome. Uh, and in both of these cases, uh, what they're utilizing is upstream information, and in some cases combined with real-time data that you're generating as you're testing the device in order to be able to predict the outcome on a, a VMIN measurement or a trim solution so that you can get to that answer more quickly and use the least amount of test time that it takes to get there and still come to the right answer. So there's been a lot of great work that people have been publishing over the last few years on these kinds of applications. So, uh, so what we've been working on is a high performance compute solution that attaches securely to the ATE in order to be able to take these, uh, these analytics that people are developing, particularly machine learning based, and decouple them from the test program so that they can be uh, containerized and run in this secure application uh, with high performance and secure connections back and forth between the ATE uh, and, the, and, the, and this box or whatever that's performing these inferences in order to be able to react adaptively to the material that's being tested. So we've been working with fabulous folks. And in these cases, the, the, the folks are developing their own applications in this infrastructure, one in a dynamic retest uh, type approach and the other on a tiered binning. Tiered binning, in case you're not familiar with it, is the notion that you may have grade one material, grade two material, grade three material, and you're you're adapting the test in such a way that you get to the answer on this. This is a grade one, two, or three device very quickly. They develop these applications, as I mentioned, in a containerized way, so it makes them relatively uh, uh, invariant to changes in the overall compute infrastructure, so you can deploy these things reliably and securely. And, and people are having good success in order to be able to do, a, a, for, the, you know, for, for, for the first time, sort of a real-time uh, analytics solution that can react to the material in milliseconds in production test and, and still be able to uh, provide the, you know, the, the good outcomes that you would do if you were just using the ATE alone, albeit with somewhat less performance than what we can do here. So I'll pause again and see if there are other questions. Uh, root cause is not required for production test. Production test is not intended to be diagnostic in nature necessarily. Uh, from Dale Omar. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although I would say that, you know, there are a lot of people that are talking today about uh, doing volume diagnostics. And, uh, and so what you're doing there is you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, collect the information that's necessary so that later on you can do the analytics in order to be able to get down to a failing gate, for example, in the case of scan diagnostics. So there are people that are doing those kinds of things and you said necessarily. So I think probably we're thinking the same thing. There's a question from Phil Nye, related chiplets and, and, and final package integration test. If chiplet is purchased from a different company, whoops, it's moving around on me. Uh, what data would, would, would help the final package integrator package test optimize testing? Um, well, one of, the, uh, one of the examples that I'm, you know, one of the examples I'm familiar with is this notion of die matching or whatever, and uh, I can't kind of get into the specifics of it too much, but if you have a, a, a sort of a performance or a frequency related thing, then you need to know uh, the, the performance of, the, of each of the chiplets in order to be able to match them so that when you put them together in, in the integrator, 
in, in an integrated form, the things are going to function correctly. And so it's, uh, it's, it's not so much a question of optimizing testing as it is in order to optimize yield, but you still have to have that information. I'm hoping I'm answering your question, Phil, but if not, we can kind of come back to it. Uh, Dale commented early, early uh, going back to the diagnostic information, agree early in the early in life of the product, not necessarily later in the life of product. And again, I would agree with that characterization. Uh, one other question, is the training of the data done in real time and deployed to the edge, or do you foresee it being done in real time? And I think Sergio kind of talked about this a little bit. There is some there is some training that's done initially, and then uh, but you're kind of having the and, and that that's probably going to be an a priori kind of thing. But then we're going to uh, retrain the models periodically in order to keep them up to date because as we talked about, the material is kind of a moving target and it's going to be adjusted on the fly. Uh, it's, and it's going to be kind of moving on the fly, and you have to adjust the models on the fly. Uh, does the adaptive test result into process? Does the adaptive test result into process adjustment to affect the next on the production line? What happens with this wafer? Is it salvaged or deemed partly good? I'm trying to understand the intent of that question. Um, I, I think, you know, so you mentioned process adjustment, you know, certainly, you know, and it, it also depends on where we're talking about. If we're talking about a wafer probe, yes, you could collect information that you might want to feed back to the fab in order to make a process adjustment, uh, in order to improve overall yield. So, that, so this notion of feeding back, which we haven't really talked about thus far is an important element. What happens to the wafer that you're being tested? Is it salvaged or deemed partially good? Well, that's probably going to be driven largely by you know how much yield do you have on the wafer there'll be rules that'll be established that will say below a certain yield point you probably just scrap the wafer but that's going to be up to the manufacturing folks to determine what are the challenges uh, being able to connect the test cell to the cloud from a security standpoint well um, obviously you know that uh, in the case of the real-time solution that we're talking about, it's connected to the test cell, but not directly to the cloud. But if you're, if you're communicating data to the cloud, obviously you have to have all the security measures in place in order to encrypt the data when it's moving, and you have to have authentication that's involved so that the, the sources that ask for the data and the sources that accept the data are authenticated with each other so that uh, there's only, only, only the data exchanges are allowed between two authenticated parties that agree that they have access to that same piece of information. And there's a whole lot of details that goes into how to doing that. I don't have time to cover here today, but hopefully that answers that question. So now I think I'm gonna continue because we are uh, some minutes in and it's probably time to make sure that we get through the rest of the material. Um, so the other, the other question I wanted to talk about was this notion of breaking down the silos. Um, and you know, the, 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 the problem example I wanna talk about is this prediction of burning of wafer probe needles. So when you're probing a wafer, if you have excessive heating or you have excessive current that's going on, you can, you can actually physically melt a probe needle. Uh, and, and these things are, are disruptive to the environment because you have to stop the test process, you have to perhaps pull the probe card offline and repair it uh, in order to be able to get it back online. And, and, the, and the difficulty that comes here is that there's a lot of different potential root causes that would, that would, that would cause these things in the first place. And, you, and there's a lot of different information that you have to go through in order to be able to, to find out what the potential root cause is and, and be able to predict the, an ensuing event that's about to occur. It can have to do with the design of the probe card. It can have to do with the design of the chip. Uh, and the power grids on the chip. It has to do with the equipment maintenance schedules, uh, with the probe cards maintenance schedules, and all these information is typically available, but it's typically collected in these different silos, and, and the challenge here becomes how to be able to integrate it all together in order to be able to say, I can wade through you know, six or eight different weighted, uh, data sources in order to be able to come to a root cause uh, on a particular event, or, or better still, to be able to predict it before it occurs. Electronic chip ID or ESIDs are commonplace in large digital SOCs, but there, it's, today it's done in a fairly non-standard way where each company is gonna have their own approach. There is some work going on to kind of develop standardized methods for that, but that's still kind of early. So 
coming to the conclusions then, well, I hope what I've communicated to you that, you know, the data creation, the rate at which we're creating data and the diversification of that is growing at an exponential rate. Test plays a critical function because test is the one function that attaches to every product and collects and harvests all this information that feeds uh, the overall uh, value chain uh, for, uh, for yield, for process improvement, and for all these other activities that we have to do in order to keep things moving. Chiplet-based products are, are particularly challenging because of their, their size and complexity. Uh, we see quality requirements increasing, and particularly in key sectors such as automotive, where there's a zero defects goal that we have to, uh, we have to be able to uh, reach. Uh, that drives the need for uh, advanced techniques to be able to identify at-risk units, and Sergio talked about some of that, uh, and uh, we've, we've done kind of a bit of work that as well. Machine learning is becoming much more commonplace because you need these techniques in order to be able to be very selective about finding just the units that are failing without too much overkill. And, and the supply chain is disaggregated, so data still has to move across boundaries securely while, while protecting people's IP. Again, Sergio talked about that. I don't think I need to add anything more to that. Uh, but you know, the great thing is, is that our industry is responding with a lot of innovative solutions. And I, I know just the ITC data that I showed you is an example where it's, you know, people are moving, are looking to data science to solve these problems. So it's a great time to be, a, you know, a data nerd if you are like me and, and working in this area because there's so much going on. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to acknowledge that there's a lot of contributions from folks uh, to the work that I presented here. And I just wanted to acknowledge their contributions. So couldn't do it without all this team of people. And then I'll stop there and see if we have any additional questions. Thank you, Ken. I think one question while you were finishing up in, in general, can the result of e-test parametric test bribe line tell you a root cause of failure as chiplet DUT? I, I, I would say, you know, I, I don't know that I can tell you that I've seen a, a specific uh, uh, publication or anything that's done that. But what I, what I will say is that um, I, I, I am familiar with some work that was done. Uh, I believe it was Cal Santa Barbara, but it was not the Lisi Wong. And, and uh, the idea was that we're using e-test information to sort of map what the overall wafer looks like and be able to predict things like yield or performance to particular parameters or, or whatever. And it was, it was interesting how, how well uh, that, that could be done just based on you know, watt data. Uh, and so once you get some sort of an idea of the hot and cold regions of the wafer, then that gives you an idea of the performance of, of the of, of dye that fall into those particular regions. So you can do some amount of predictive outcomes just by looking at e-test data, I would say yes. But, the specific instance of doing that as a chiplet as part of a larger dud, I don't believe I've seen anywhere. Ken, do you have any sense of, you know, we've talked about e-test data and some other presenters have mentioned sensor data. Do you have a, any opinion on the usefulness of e-test data versus sensor data potentially taken at wafer sort test? Sensor data taken at wafer sort tests. Yes, I mean, you know, there's a, you know, people have for years been incorporating uh, sensors on dye, uh, you know, temperature sensors, ring oscillators, those kinds of things. And uh, so, and, and, you know, on dye parametric structures in general. And, you know, there, there's definitely useful information that comes out of that. And people do do that in production. A lot of times what you'll see is, you know, maybe going back to Dale Omar's comment that it may be done early when you're doing process learning. And then as the process matures, maybe you find less of a need to collect and utilize that information. Uh, and so maybe it gets dialed back a little bit in the, in the, in the pursuit of, of test time improvement. Um, so, but yeah, there's no question that people are doing those kinds of things and making use of it, particularly early in the process. All right, thank you, Ken, a very good presentation. Um, like to thank all the presenters who uh, presented today and I also want to give an extra special thank you to all the sponsors who made this event possible. Our diamond sponsor is Omcor, 
with differentiators in technology, quality, and service. Our Emerald sponsors are uh, Adventist, uh, rated number one in the VLSI uh, research for ATE uh, survey, a synopsis uh, from silicon to software, and our Ruby sponsor, uh, Tech Search International. So I'd like to thank all of them once again for making this event possible. I'd like to thank all of you for attending and look forward to seeing everybody here back again tomorrow. So thank you and have a good rest of your day.